Welcome to Meadowsweet Farm Fiber Arts Design Studio. This is a podcast about knitting, spinning, weaving, and just about anything that's related to textiles. I am very passionate about textiles as an art form. It provides me an opportunity for self-expression. I'm also very dedicated to preserving the rich textile history and traditions that have been passed on through the generations. So I invite you to sit back with a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and enjoy my creative life here at Meadowsweet Farm. Welcome to Meadowsweet Farm Fiber Arts Design Studio. My name's Bonnie, and today is February 7, 2020, Saturday morning, around 10 o'clock in the morning, and we have had so much snow. This is great. I'm really happy. I love snow. Uh, when I woke up yesterday morning, there was several inches on the ground, and it just it looked like those little snow globes that you shake. Uh, it was just great big giant snowflakes and I just decided I'm gonna stay in and just enjoy the enjoy the day. So uh, I got a lot of paperwork done for, for my college courses. So first of all, I would like to thank Chevy Rell. Um, she gave me such a beautiful welcome on her podcast and um, the responses that I've been getting and the comments are just so beautiful. So thank you so much. I also would like to thank Gaina from Tales from Cuckoo Land. Uh, she gave me a beautiful welcome on her podcast and um, I just thank you so much. Uh, Gaina and I have known each other through Instagram and through her podcast and um, I just I just really enjoy both uh, listening to both of their podcasts and uh, so thank you so much and also thank you again for the beautiful responses and the wonderful comments I, I really really am so humbled and because of that uh, I would like to start this second podcast with a giveaway so um, in the last podcast I showed some photographs of the hitchhiker scarf and I've made so many of those over the years and um, I have been using this yarn and it is um, I know I won't say it right it's K-H-U-S-K-U and this is uh, a word for colorful it means colorful and it's hand painted it's merino bamboo and nylon so i always purchase this yarn for the bamboo scarf at a little yarn shop in bluefield west virginia it's called the bluefield yarn company and oh it's just my my favorite place to go when i'm teaching in uh, west virginia and i just really uh, i i love uh, the owner and Karen and I also just love her shop it's it's wonderful so I would like to give this yarn um, away it only takes one skein if anyone's interested 
Um, I purchased the Hitchhiker Scarf Pattern on Ravelry and it only takes one skein and the scarf is, it's an, a nice size. I, uh, I've made several of them for Stephen. I made a few for myself and I've made probably five or six and I've given them away. So I have one on the needles right now. And the really fun thing about this, I, I love the points. And when you, when you block it, you really, really do see <clears throat> the points. Um, and they're, they're just, they're really fun. So, uh, and you can just see the beautiful colors. You start off um, with just a few stitches on your needle down here, and then it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And it, uh, it grows quite a bit at the very end. You end up with um, probably about 120 stitches on your needle when you're finished. I usually go by, by points, so I'm not, um, so I make sure I have enough at the end. So usually about 35 points um, uh, will give you um, a finished scarf. So I usually, I like to count the points so I get to see, okay, I'm halfway done, I'm almost done. So, but this is really a fun, fun scarf to make. So whether you make the hitchhiker or not, I would like to uh, give this away. And you can see the colors are pretty true in, in the camera. It's got some grays and pink and green. It's really pretty and I think it's gonna make a gorgeous scarf or whatever you decide to to do with this so what i'd like to do is in the comments below i would like you to tell me what your favorite fiber arts project is that you like to work on so for me unfortunately everything i'm working on whether it's knitting or spinning or weaving or quilting or making garments i love it all i i can never say you know, I just like to do this. So I'd like to hear if you have a favorite. And um, with the next podcast, I'll do a, a random selection and um, I'll uh, send off the lucky winner, this, this beautiful yarn. Okay. So um, I did forget, uh, I just want to mention that, and I will put uh, all the places that you can find me. <clears throat> I'm on Instagram. Uh, I do have a Facebook page. I'm on Ravelry. I don't have um, a Ravelry group set up just yet. I'm not sure if I'm going to do that or not. Um, I'm just going to um, see how things go here. And I have an Etsy shop and I'll share all those places with you along with um, the website for the Bluefield Yarn Company if anyone's interested in purchasing this yarn. So um, I'd like to share with you a few things, uh, just to, to talk about a few things. And then today I would really like to spend some time on um, quilting. So I'm not going to share uh, how to quilt. I'm just going to share a couple quilting stories with you that I think you'll be interested in. Um, this is a scarf that my daughter bought me. She was a student up at Penn State University several years ago. And for my birthday, I went to visit her and this is what she gave me. And she got it at a local shop up in, uh, up at Penn State, the main campus. And I think it was, um, a shop that carried the fair trade um, items with it. So this is, looks to me like it's hand spun, hand woven, and hand painted. And the thing that I'm, I'm there's everything about this I just absolutely love. But this is, I don't know if you can see it and I'll take a picture and insert it, but this is in, it's woven in two strips, and then they, they um, hand stitched the pieces together. It's just beautiful. The designs on this are 
beautiful. So this is hand painted. Now, later on in, in a few episodes, I am going to share with you um, how to do mud, mud painting on cloth. And I have some examples of that, but I just wanted to share this with you because I thought it was just so beautiful. It has so much meaning to me, first of all, because my daughter Jacqueline gave it to me. And second, because it's just, everything about it is just hand made. And even the buttons, or not the buttons, but the little, um, the little ornaments for the tassels. These are clay and they're handmade and they add a little bit of weight to the scarf and then they make a really beautiful delicate sound uh, when you're wearing this. So I just I just really love this this scarf and I, I just wanted to share this with you. So I will put some photographs, insert photographs in for this as well. What I'd like to share with you now is a project that I'm going to work on and I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about it. I love to hand spin yarn and I purchased um, this roving. It's got some gorgeous colors in it and when I was spinning it, um, it just, it was really so much fun. It's got teal and green and blue and it's probably not going to show up but there's a little bit of gold uh, strands in there it's just it's really really pretty so if you notice um, the way that this is um, I didn't put it into uh, a, a traditional skein I Basically what I did is when I took it off the Nitty Naughty, I just twisted it and then I laid it flat on the table. So years ago there was uh, a spinner and you may still remember her. Her name is Catherine Alexander. And I feel as if she just really took knitting and spinning and just kind of turned things on its edge. Um, she was actually living in Pittsburgh and she came to our local guild meetings and what she was doing was, first of all, she was using about 20 different colors in her designs and she was doing a, a technique called entrelock, which most of us at that point hadn't really, really heard. This was probably in the 80s and no one had really knew anything about entrelock. And, you know, she's making these little squares that, you know, they're going this way and this way and creating with the, the squares and the pattern and different colors of yarn, just some really, really beautiful, beautiful garments. Beautiful socks, and I think she was on the cover of spin-off magazine uh, with her socks that were they were just really fun and very colorful and and uh, she's just a delightful person so she started experimenting and I'm I'm gonna try this I I've never really given it a shot I took a workshop with her years and years ago and I I did some of her techniques then but I'm really going to try to play with this. And what she does with her designs is she, the, the energy that's in this yarn right now is all being stored. And when you spin on a spinning wheel, you can either spin S or Z. 
And what that means is that the yarn is being spun either in this direction or in this direction. So you think of it like an S or you think of it like a Z. So Z spun and S spun. So when you take your yarn, if you spin it purposely with intention and you spin some of your roving S and some of your roving Z, if you knit with that and you don't block the yarn, you keep that twist going in that direction, what used to be referred to as a mistake, Catherine turned it into a design element. Because if I just took this yarn as it was and I knitted with it, it would bias. And so, you know, again, depending on whether it was being spun S or Z, it gave you a direction of your fabric that would either go this way or this way. So what she, in her workshop, which she was teaching us is that we spin a little bit of S and a little bit of Z, and then we use the direction of those knitted stitches to create patterns um, in our cloth. So this is um, Z spun, and I'm going to spin some other yarn and make it S spun. So I will keep you posted on this because I think this is gonna be a fun project for me to experiment with. She also takes this and she, she stores this energy. And, and I have a video of hers and it's, it's just really fascinating how, um, how the yarn can retain this energy that it has for a really, really long time. I, I guess the life of the yarn. And if you wet this and you block it, or if you ply two of these together, then you lose that energy. You lose that Z or S twist. It relaxes it enough that it, it doesn't bias. And that's what we were always used to, is a yarn that that had two or more threads twisted together so that, you know, our stitches were, um, were straight and they didn't lean in one direction or another. So I think it's gonna be a fun experiment. So, so far I have this, and this yarn, or this roving, oh, let me get the package here. This is, um, I bought this um, at a little uh, outdoor festival in near Bluefield, West Virginia uh, last summer. And this is a company called Gypsy Mountain Farm. This is Falkland South Down. It has some Tussis silk and Firestar, I think is the, is the gold. And that's Gabe upstairs. <laughs> Um, I did try to film Gabe with me, and he just, he was just silly. So I will bring him down before we leave so he can say hello and have his debut. So, um, but anyway, this is, this is going to be my new project. I'm going to try to use the bias S and Z and uh, try to create uh, some kind of a design element using using the twist in in the threads here So um, You can see Scarlet Kitty <laughs> in the back um, It's been a long day. It's um, I took Gabe for a walk. It's starting to snow again and um, My hair is all monkey um, but um, I did want to share one more project with you that I'm working on. I took a class with, with Beth Brown Renzel in November with our guild, and we were doing Lativian fingerless mitts. And here's, oh, I, I'm not sure if you, I'll put some photographs in so that you can see. There are photographs from the workshop of some of the
kittens that she made, but uh, you got a kit and she went through the steps. I ended up getting her video, so I knew that it was right before Thanksgiving and once the holidays hit, anything that's going to require me to concentrate and focus on, um, it's out the window. <laughs> I didn't even want to try. So I'm not a big double pointed needle person. So, um, so this is, uh, this is all that I have so far, but, um, you start off with this scallop edging around the bottom of the, of the mitt, and then you start your color work. And I absolutely love it. I'm really having a good time. So, um, so I just wanted to share that with you. The colors are, there's, um, and those are pretty true. It's a, a green and a gold. And then we have a blue and a burnt orange. And last but not least, we have a burgundy color. So those are all the colors. So, <clears throat> I guess this is it for now. Um, it's getting really dark. Um, it's about six o'clock, 5.30, somewhere in there. And I went up to the barn and I gave the horses some hay. I usually give them round bales once a week, great big giant round bales. And my neighbor who helps us put the round bales in the great big uh, round pen, uh, he's not going to be back until Tuesday, and they they still have some hay in the in the ring. But I just wanted to add a little bit extra because it's snowing and it's not too terribly cold. But that's how they stay warm with hay. So I went up into the barn, and um, there's a dead skunk by the tractor. It was about 4.30 in the afternoon yesterday and it had, it was not snowing all day and all of a sudden it started and I thought this would be a really nice time to share a really special place on my farm. These pine trees are massive. They're probably over 30 years old. We purchased this farm in 1987 and this was basically a cornfield. There's about 25 acres in the back of the farm that's pretty heavily wooded, but the rest of the land was just open. And I don't live on a mountain, but I do live on a ridge, and it's pretty windy up here. And especially in the winter time, in the summer it's great because there's a nice breeze that comes through the house. It's a pretty constant breeze but in the winter it gets it gets pretty pretty cold so we thought uh, the Norway spruce and the white pine if we lined our driveway and lined several areas around the house that that would provide us with a really nice windbreak and it really has plus the aesthetics of the trees the Norway spruce are my favorite I just, I really love the way the the branches hang and the snow collects on the trees. It's really pretty. So we started off and we purchased a thousand Norway spruce and they were just little seedlings about 12 inches tall and we, we uh, purchased white pine. And believe it or not, all these trees made it. We were afraid the deer might eat the trees when they were just little little tiny saplings and uh, we put an electric fence around the trees my father came and helped us put the fence around them and we really didn't lose I don't think we lost any so we planted all 2,000 trees and we lined our driveway and around the house with the trees and then our neighbors needed pine trees too so they came and took 
some trees so if you're driving down our road you'll see wherever there's a pine tree it probably started here on this farm right in that spot right there This is a quilt that has been in Stephen's family for many, many years. I'm not sure how old this is or who made it, but I just am in love with the pattern and the colors. Uh, it's a lot of rectangles, and then there's one little section where they started using triangles and putting a little bit of triangle patterning at the very edge. But what's really fascinating, the stitches are big and the quilting threads are pretty coarse. Uh, not, not the quilting threads that I'm used to using. But what I was really intrigued with is the batting on this quilt. What they've done is where the threads have worn away, where the fabric has worn away, it exposes the batting which is a hand-spun, hand-woven blanket. It's a wool blanket. And it's just so dear to me. I'm just so fascinated with the fact that not only are they using old shirts and things to put the pieces of the quilt together, but they're also using an old wool blanket. Hi, um, it's actually the following week and um, I forgot to uh, publish and talk about the um, Amish quilts from Wales. And so I wanted to be able to share a little bit of information with you related to that. Um, I got interested in this topic. Um, it's Amish Quilts and the Welsh Connection. Um, and it's by Dorothy Osler. And I'll share a few photographs of the book with you. Um, I got interested in this for a couple different reasons. First of all, um, my family is from Wales, and my father and uh, his descendants were Welsh. And on my mom's side, um, my grandfather and his brother and his three brothers and his father came first in 1912 and they were from Manchester, England. And I, I have this, you know, just really strong connection with weaving and spinning and knitting and also with quilting that I'm thinking, you know, there's no one else in my family that does this but me. And I feel like I must have that gene somehow. So I started to uh, read through this book and <clears throat> what was really fascinating was there is a connection between the designs that the people were quilting, the quilting designs from Wales, uh, with the Amish quilts that were made in America. So they give several examples and again this is this is still being researched, but the Welsh people, when they were making their quilts in Wales, they were using wool fabric and they were quilting very simple, very, very plain designs. The connection between Amish and the Welsh takes place in the United States and it was probably in the early 19th century. And a lot of settlements between the Amish and the Welsh seem to connect in a variety of different places in Pennsylvania. And they give, they cite several examples in the book where there were settlements of Amish and Welsh folks living 
within close proximity of each other in places like York, Pennsylvania, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And it wasn't really until um, the industrial um, era took place in Pittsburgh when they started to do the, the milling that the folks from Wales came to Pittsburgh. And I believe there were still some Amish communities that settled in the Pittsburgh area as well. I'm not sure how heavy that is. But it just really, really fascinated me just because my family is has had all settled in Pittsburgh, both on my mom's side, which is the Manchester, England side, and then also my father's side, which um, they're primarily from Wales. So I just, I was really fascinated by this, and I would like to share with you a little project that I took on uh, several years ago. I, I have an Amish friend, her name is Rebecca, and Rebecca and I met when my daughters and her children were really tiny. In fact, I remember when she had her daughter, Sarah, and I went to visit her, and Sarah was completely dressed in the Am Amish garb. She had the little bonnet and the little shoes and the, the little black stockings, and she was just adorable. And so we met, and I think the two of us I, I was looking for a quilting frame and her husband made me the frame and then I went to pick the frame up and there was Rebecca. And just a, a few little notes about her. She is a, absolutely the most neatest gardener I've ever, ever met. And I remember walking to her house and the first time I met them, they were in a small house on the family farm and then when I went to see them again, the way the Amish community works their family um, uh, living situation, when the younger folks start to have children, the parents move out of the really large house and they move into the small house and then the children raise their children in the larger house. So when I went to visit Rebecca to get across a little stream from their little driveway or the entrance to their property, you had to walk across this little tiny bridge. And as soon as you crossed over the bridge, on either side of the bridge was this absolutely neat, tidy, beyond belief, um, vegetable garden. And she had flowers on the outside and, and it was just precious. So we met with each other through the years, but then as things happen, uh, my life got busy, hers got busy. We wrote to each other very sparsely and she was probably a better writer than, than I was at the time at keeping up with writing. And eventually we just lost touch. So a few years ago, I was in that area and I thought, oh, I wonder if Rebecca still lives here. I wonder if she will even remember me. So I pulled into their little drive area and I walked across that little bridge and there was this perfect garden. And I thought either Rebecca's still here or if her daughter lives here now, perhaps her daughter is taking on mom's duties. So I knocked on the door and I looked in the door and the window and there was Rebecca. And she kind of had this like weird look on her face at first. And you know, she, she was a little older and had glasses now and, but it was still Rebecca. And so I knocked on the door and we, looked at each other in the eye and I had this like big giant smile on my face and all of a sudden I could see that she recognized me and she just started laughing and just like this giant smile so it was it was just really really a fun fun meeting so as we're talking I'm telling her about this you know my heritage with uh, my family descendants from Wales and you know just the connection between the designs of 
Amish, you know, the very simple and plain designs that they can trace them back to a lot of the designs that were quilted um, before anybody settled, any of the folks from Wales or the folks from, um, from the Amish community settled in, in America. So we decided to uh, do a little project together and I want to share that with you. This is, I didn't say okay, but I should probably say it just, just because I do all the time. <laughs> um, this is a quilt, a quilt top that Rebecca made for me. And it's a baby quilt top, it's a baby quilt top. And it's got all these gorgeous stars, beautiful colors. I don't have any grandchildren. I hope I'm going to have one because this is for my grandchild. And let's see if we can show the other ones. There's a blue one and some pink ones. And the batting. The uh, binding, actually, she made the binding for me too, and it's all these colors uh, on the binding. And then I purchased this yellow, it's yellow polka dot fabric. So I've been hand quilting this, and um, you know, for me, I love to quilt and I love to piece all of this together. Um, I, I like machine quilting, I like hand quilting, I love all of it, but the hardest part for me is figuring out what kind of quilting designs to put on a quilt. So I am I guess I'm okay with what I have, and it's all hearts, um, you know, because if, if a little grandchild gets this, of course, you know, this was made with love. So, but what we collaborated on was the notion of the Amish designs and the connection possibly to uh, its origin coming from Wales. She's going to be making me a few more quilt tops and once I get those over the years I will share those with you. But I would like to share just the uh, kind of the final note from from this author about her idea and this possibility and there have been other researchers over the years that have researched this notion that there is a really strong design connection between the Welsh quilts and their origins with the Amish So she says, comparing the design styles of the 19th century Amish and Welsh quilts has revealed some clear distinctions between the extent to which Amish quilts from the Midwest and Amish quilts from the Lancaster tradition correlate with Welsh quilts. Though all Amish quilts share a color palette with Welsh quilts, Together with the use of plain cloth, the pieced and quilting designs on Amish quilts from most Midwest states were drawn from the dynamic quilt making traditions of 19th century America, at least in the last quarter of that century. For the piece designs, there is, a conclu there is conclusive evidence that this was so. The Amish and the Wel Welsh communities lived in close continuity in the 19th century America, and that is now established. Identifying precise geographic localities where these two communities came together was a major objective of this research. But to build on the evidence based now laid down, 
locally based archive researches in these localities will be required to progress the research agenda. If further insight is to be gained into Welsh influence on Amish quilt making and the interrelationships between Amish and Welsh communities, it is most likely to come from in-depth studies of primary data resources in the localities where Amish and Welsh settlement paths crossed in the 19th century America. And the quilts remain. As objects, they remain for further investigative and critical study, but they also remain as metaphors for the hidden paths of history and cultural connections that can be revealed when their seams are unpicked and pried open. Thank you for listening. Um, several years ago, many, many, many years ago, I took a quilting class at a local Joanne Fabrics, and my daughter, Samantha, who's now 34, um, was just two years old, and she's the oldest of my two daughters, and Samantha is um, finishing up her PhD at the University of Pittsburgh, and my other daughter, Jacqueline, um, is a pilot for Republic Airlines. So I, I'm very proud of both of them. Um, but I, uh, I made this quilt for Samantha, and it's a sampler. And again, I will, I'll, I'll put a better picture, but just to show you the squares, I love the bear's paw. That's one of my favorite, but it's got, um, There's that one. I, I, I'm not sure what that is. I don't know if it's Jacob's, not Jacob's ladder. I'm not sure what that one is. Um, and this is grandmother's fan. And let's see what other ones. It's just got so many beautiful, beautiful Ohio star. I put that in the center. And there's the flying geese. So um, I have a blog spot and I'm going to share with you the blog that I wrote about this special quilt. And I'll also put a link to my blog below. I, I write not a lot, maybe two or three entries a year. I'll try to start writing a little bit more. I also have an Etsy shop. I have some hand-woven scarves in there, and I make paper stars, and I dip them in beeswax, and I also have uh, some, um, some beeswax candles that I make in my shop. So I'm gonna try to put some other fun things in there too, but uh, for now, I, my shop is a little, uh, a little barren at the moment, so I'll have to restock everything. But anyway, let me share with you what I wrote about this special quilt. This is called 20 Some Years in the Making. Dear Diary, yes, I can enter this in a contest for the longest to finish quilt. I started this quilt for my daughter, Samantha, when she was just two years old. I took a quilting class at a local quilt shop Ah, oh, as a young mother, I had visions of quilting by the fire and was dreaming of having quilting bees at my home. Well, 20 years later, and this poor thing is still not done. 
Samantha, all of 24 years old now, she's 34. The really sad thing is this little bugger was completely done by hand, using scissors to cut the fabric pieces, no rotary cutter for me, and hand stitched each piece. Then I carefully hand quilted using wool batting, big mistake. It was so hard to quilt. I dragged this quilt in and out of my life for years. Finally, the quilt was complete, except for the binding. It was so dirty, you can only imagine. So, guess what the fiber expert did? Yep, she put it in the washing machine, some kind of brain clog due to the sheer excitement of a near completed project. Well, you guessed it. It shrunk into the saddest mess you could ever imagine. I'm the kind of person who doesn't cry easily, but when I start, you cannot stop me. All those locked up tears just flow out in ocean waves. I've never been one to cry over spilt milk, but this quilt, tidal waves of tears. I called my fiber and crime friend, Kathy, to come to the rescue because, well, she always does. Even when I'm lost in my car, I call her and she and Bill get out the maps and they redirect me. Well, this time, all she could do was hug me over the phone. Not much you can do, B. Well, I took every quilted stitch out and I marched over to my friend Kay's house. She's got a long arm quilting machine. And I said, Kay, please fix this now. I gave this quilt to my daughter, Samantha, this year for Christmas. And I don't know if she will ever really understand all of the trial and error that went into making this quilt. I do believe, however, that the projects I work on always seem to connect to the fabric of my life. This quilt represents the trials and errors and the steadfast love that I have had being a mom, always wanting to do the very best for my daughters, not taking any shortcuts, even if it meant using tools that took up more time. It is worth it. There will be no stone unturned because it comes from the heart. Making mistakes along the way, sometimes huge ones, but never ever giving up. Even when you've made ones innocently, always having good intentions, shrinking, ugh, huge mistake. You just don't give up and you try again, sometimes, you have to take it to someone else to fix, like God. And you see with patience and steadfast love, things do get mended, the quilt gets complete, and another memory embraced, and life moves forward. How simple our lives would be if we could fix mistakes by taking out stitches and starting all over again. Perhaps, that's just what we need to do. Blessings to all. B. from teaching at uh, uh, Campus College in West Virginia. Ugh. Pictures of some of the scarves that I've made. But um, I, I, I have one in the works right now. <laughs> I'm tongue-tied. Thank you. I would like to sh thank, shank, 